In this project, I'll be showing you how soft particles work. This is an interesting effect that's been around for quite a while. I know NVIDIA has a paper as far back as 2007, but I also know that I came up with this effect a few years before that, so it's been around for quite a while. We used the tech as part of a pitch demo to green light prototype for production, so I'm super familiar with the technique. So before we get too deep into things, I find it's helpful to talk about the problem we're trying to solve. So let's take a look at a simple example. I've built this simple scene here, and when we zoom in, you immediately start to notice this problem down here. See these lines here against the ground? This is caused by the particles clipping against the scene geometry. What's happening here is, well, let's draw a simple 2D version of what's happening. So you've got a basic scene, and up here is the camera. So if I draw a particle here, you can notice that it kind of goes in behind the geometry. So that's the problem. We need a way to hide that transition, aka the clipping against the scene geometry. And fortunately, there's a simple and easy solution. What you can do is, if you knew how far away the particle was in front of the existing geometry, you could modulate the particle's alpha to fade it out near the point of contact. And as often happens, things that are easy in theory aren't quite as easy in practice. There's a couple of problems that we need to figure out here. The first is, in the fragment shader for the particle, you need to access a few things. You need the view space depth of the particle, and you need the actual depth of the scene behind it. And this is so you can fade things out as the distance closes, as the distance between them gets smaller. The second problem is, we're probably just going to use the depth buffer, which is perfectly fine, but there's a small hitch. When you read from the depth buffer, the values aren't in view space, so they'll need to be transformed. Let's solve the first problem. So we need the actual depth of the scene behind a particle. And typically, you do this by rendering the scene and then binding the depth buffer as a texture and reading it back while rendering the particles. A lot of modern 3D engines utilize what's called the Z prepass step, where you disable color rights and then fill in the depth buffer using a cheap shader. I'm not clear that 3GS does that, or it's not super obvious in my research, just consisted of Googling it once. So instead, what I'll do is simply split my objects into opaque and transparent, and render the opaque objects to a separate depth buffer first. This isn't ideal, but I'm just showing you how the technique works. Loading that up shows, well, nothing, just the scene, which is kind of expected. We can confirm it's working by going back into the code, applying our depth texture to a quad, and then loading things back up. As I move around, we can see the depth showing up in the quad. So this is working as intended, and we can move on with our lives. Now let's solve the second problem. The second problem is a bit trickier. You want to read out the depth values from the depth buffer, and you also want these in view space, but they're not in view space. To understand what's actually in the depth buffer, we'll do a crash course run through of the transforms OpenGL does. Now just a bit of a heads up, this will be a little boring. But as graphics programmers, this is also pretty important to know. So here's a crash course on the OpenGL transforms. Let's say you have this model straight out of Blender. This would be in local space. Multiplying that by the world or the model matrix brings that to world space. Multiplying that by the view matrix brings that to view space. Multiplying that by the projection matrix brings us to clip space. Dividing the clip space coordinate by W, so X, Y, Z components all divided by the W component, brings us to normalized device coordinate space, or NDC space. From there, points in NDC space are transformed to screen space using your screen size and the specified depth range. And usually this defaults to 0 and 1. Now, it can be different. In fact, flipping them is a common trick for bigger worlds to gain extra depth buffer resolution in the distance. But I'm pretty sure this isn't exposed in 3JS, so we can ignore that safely for the purposes of this demo. Let's say we're transforming a view space point, so 0, 0, Z with W equals 1, since we only care about recovering view space depth. Now, we're going to multiply that by the projection matrix, and as a reminder, this is what the OpenGL projection matrix looks like. So 0, 0, and we'll call this Z view and 1, transformed by the projection matrix, will give us 0, 0, and we'll call this Z clip and W clip, where Z clip is equal to, well, I'm not going to read this out. You can just look on the screen. 
Now we're going to bring that clip space Z from clip space to normalized device coordinate space. So Z NDC is equal to Z clip divided by W clip, which is Z clip divided by negative Z view. And then finally, the last transform, which brings it into the depth range. So assuming the depth range of 0 to 1, so that means that the final Z value is Z NDC times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5. And basically the whole point of this is that we want to express the final z as a function of z view. So we can just work our way backwards now. So that means z final is z ndc times 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5. And then we can substitute in that uh, whole chunk of code for z ndc. And I won't keep narrating these because uh, there's a lot of stuff here, but if you're interested, just freeze the frames of the video and follow the derivation. It's not too complicated. Try to not skip too many steps here, and it should be a mostly straightforward algebraic reduction. And what we end up with finally at the end is that z view is equal to the near times the far divided by far minus near times z final minus f, where z final is the value that you read from the depth buffer. So that's a little involved. Sorry about that. It's kind of gross, but at least you learned something, right? And 3GS did have a function to do this for you, although it doesn't seem to take into account depth range. But if you're using DirectX or just straight WebGL with different depth ranges, now you can repeat the process for yourself. Let's code this up. I did a tutorial on making your own particle system a while back, so I've just copied that straight into this project. We're going to modify the shader code for this guy. What I've done is added a new uniform called depth texture. And down here in the main, I just need to make a small modification. We're going to add this, and it's a simple fall off using the difference between the particle's depth and the scene depth behind it. Then we can simply modulate the alpha using that. And of course, we don't forget to declare the uniforms and actually set them in the render loop. When I load that up, bam, you get soft particles. You can see as I zoom in and out, you don't get that harsh clipping effect right against the ground plane. And we can play with the settings a bit. So back in the code, what I'm going to do here is change the range that the falloff happens on. So if I make the range really short, let's say I use 0.01, when I load that up, look at how bad this looks now. It's almost like the previous clipping issues, and that's entirely because the falloff range is just way too short. And if you choose a size that's way too big, let's go back in the code, and let's say here that I put a constant falloff range of 5.0. When we load that up, it looks super soft here against the ground. It looks great, actually. But when we go to the torus knot, notice how none of the particles seem to want to render in front of it. That's because they're getting alphaed out too aggressively because of the large falloff. The point is that you'll need some sort of falloff that is right for the size of each individual particle. In our case, I can actually just bring the size of the particle down from the vertex shader. So I've declared a varying in the vertex and fragment shaders, and we're passing in the particle size. Now, if I use that as part of the falloff calculation, it won't matter how big or small the particles are. Last small tweak. You may want to play with the curve of the falloff a bit. So instead of a straight linear falloff, what I've done here is I've used a smooth step function to try and make the falloff a bit nicer. You can load that up and you can judge for yourself whether it's worth it or not. You can also play with raising it to a power, like x squared. A lot of the artists I worked with on Prototype actually seem to prefer that. But anyway, that's all for today. Hopefully it's enough that you can go and implement soft particles in your own projects. If you found this useful, buy me a coffee or beer on Patreon. Otherwise, like and subscribe really helps the channel grow. Until next time, cheers.